Welcome everybody. My name is Maria Gastambide and I am director and chief curator of Public Art of the University of Houston System. Public Art is the oldest arts organization within the UH system and oversees one of the most significant university public art collections in the United States. I am delighted to welcome you to the final Color Talk, which is a monthly series of conversations where we have connected virtually with the artists of Colorfield, UH's first curated exhibition of outdoor sculptures. I am happy to announce that due to popular demand, we have just extended the show's run for another three weeks. It now will close on Sunday, September 20, June 20th. If you're in Houston or coming our way, don't miss it. This afternoon, artist Spencer Finch is joined by that former museum director, Don Bacigalupi, in conversation. Spencer merges a scientific approach and poetic sensibility to localize the most elusive of experiences from the color of a sunset to the shadow of, of a passing cloud to the light of a specific place. Dan got his start at the University of Houston where he pursued undergraduate studies and later returned to lead what is now the Blaffer Gallery, what was then the Blaffer Gallery, now the Blaffer Art Museum. Since then, he has directed a number of museums including the San Diego Museum of Art, the Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art, and he was also the founding president of the Lucas Museum of Narrative Art. Before we begin, I wanted to let you know that we've planned a 40 to 45 minute conversation with a 15 minute Q&A session at the end. If you could, uh, feel free to pose your questions anytime through the Q&A um, chat box and we'll be sure to get those, go to get to those questions at the end. So without further ado, welcome Spencer and welcome back, Don. Thanks Thank Maria. You. Thanks so much, Maria, and thank you to all of your team for making this possible, and especially for occasioning an invitation to meet Spencer. Spencer, I have known your work and followed it for many years now. Jim Cohen is a longtime friend, uh, one of your dealers, and I uh, have always enjoyed your work. I've responded very, very favorably and kind of viscerally to your work, and it's a real delight to both meet you and to have a chance to hear you speak about uh, this work that I've so enjoyed. So. I just Thanks. want to um, start by saying a little bit more about my own reactions to your work and the ways in which they have moved me. And I think, you know, it's, it's always a dangerous thing for an art historian to talk about emotional reactions to work. But in fact, I think your work really operates on a number of levels that are, that produce a kind of visceral enjoyment. In fact, I'll go a little further than that in just a moment. Um, some of the things that I've enjoyed most about your work, and I'm going to ask you to kind of speak about how they operate for you as a maker, are one, the, the sheer beauty of your work. I mean, many artists, as we know, in the 21st and even the late 20th century are kind of allergic to beauty. This idea that beauty is somehow an old fashioned notion and somehow needs to be suppressed in favor of more conceptual and more rigorous pursuits. But you clearly do both and you are obviously quite interested in conceptual approaches, but you're also not at all afraid of beauty, and I admire that. Um, next, um, there's a kind of linkage between your work that is almost always, in my experience, um, supposedly abstract, that is non-representational in its form, and yet there is always a kind of inevitable referent in, in the real world, uh, something that you've studied and uh, sometimes make explicit through titles or through context. Uh, and then finally, the way that you engage color, which obviously is a center um, component of your work and even the, the title of this talk and the exhibition that occasioned it, but looking at color both from a scientific perspective or at least a layman's scientific perspective and also with a kind of poetry and a subjectivity. So I wonder, um, and wonder is the right word, your work often in, evokes in me a sense of wonder. It's a bit of childlike wonder, this idea that I'm seeing something for the first time through your eyes and through your articulation. If you could tell us a little bit about you as a child, the child that you were that may have begun this wondrous uh, investigation of the natural world. Um, yeah, I mean, those are, those are interesting observations, uh, Don. It's a, it's a good question, and I think, um, I mean, I think any artist, you know, develops over, over over time and changes and decides uh, 
consciously and unconsciously what kind of artist they want to be. And I, I started out studying, um, well, I, I started out studying literature and I was studying literature in Japan and um, was, a, uh, <laughs> was an ardent Marxist and started working with a potter and uh, became really interested in pottery and uh, because I wanted to control my means of production. So I thought I would become a, a, a village potter somewhere and sell my wares and be part of a um, be be part of a community um, in, in which I sort of controlled uh, my means of production and, and the environment. It didn't quite turn out that way, and part of that had to do with my interests that were more conceptual than actual physical. And um, and also, uh, I think what I was sort of naturally interested in as a child, and I was um, I was less of a maker. I think as a child, then a then like a watcher and a looker, and I'm still in a. a, a I, I still feel like my um, skill is uh, is is observation, and um, I, I think about one one work that I made um, several years ago is about the light in my uh, bedroom when I was a child, which is uh, it's a um, it's an installation which just sort of changes the light in the um, in the exhibition space uh, as what appears to be cars driving by and there's a street light outside. And when I first made that piece, I, uh, my brother came to the exhibition. He's a, um, he's a scientist and, and we, shared a, we shared a bedroom. And I said, don't you remember what it was like in the room? Like, you know, the lights passing and like, like how incredible it was to see the the shift of the light across the wall onto the ceiling of the headlights and the and the and the different color of the street light, um, and um, and he said, "No, I don't remember that at all." <laughs> and so, you know, I mean, kids are different, and you know, he was he had his like you know hamsters that he was running through mazes, and I was like looking at looking at the lights uh, passing through, and and that and and those kinds of observations, I think, are what partially what led me to be an artist and also part of what makes me um, make the kind of work that that I do make. That's a wonderful uh, story and and the work that we're looking at on the screen, can you relate this to what you were just speaking of? Yeah, so this is a piece, a similar piece. I've done two pieces, but this is actually the, the light in my, um, in my uh, studio at night. And this is a, a slightly more complex work in that it, um, Includes the changing street lights outside my studio in Brooklyn. I can actually show you because it's right where I, I am now. So there's there's the window that you're seeing, and um, and there there's a street light out there. Maybe you can see, and that's the wall. I built a whole wall along here, and um, and then basically copied the projection that happened at night. And there were um, so as the uh, street light changes, as the um, as the uh, walking light changes, as the uh, as the traffic light goes from red to uh, to green to yellow, um, all of that appears uh, through this window, this aperture, and is projected into the uh, into the sort of viewer the viewer space. So there's all kinds of machinery which is visible through that aperture that creates uh, the um, these overlapping uh, layers of uh, of different kinds of light that are created from the um, from the environment outside, and every I think it was about every seven minutes, um, there is a um, there's a flashing red light from an ambulance because the um, the paramedic station for my area of Brooklyn's right down down the block, and um, and they often park outside, and then when they are called for a uh, to um, to deal with something, they um, the light goes on. Amazing. So, so that that's a very interesting both uh, memory piece from your childhood, the childhood bedroom piece, and this piece a more contemporaneous evocation of a studio. But clearly, direct directly referencing real life phenomena that you experience or experience now. I want to shift to the work that's in the Color Fields exhibition. This work called Back to Kansas uh, from a few years ago that is on view now at the University of Houston and talk about the way in which um, this work is sort of a, both a memory piece. I think if you're of my generation, I think you are. We grew up watching The Wizard of Oz annually on television. I didn't see it 
on a big screen until I was an adult, but I saw it on a small screen every year. And the way in which that film sort of registered to children, obviously, um, was different for every child, including you and your brother and me and my brothers, undoubtedly. But I'm, but I'm wondering if you can talk about this work being quite uh, different than those that you just spoke about in these layers of mediation, thinking about these colors that were once part of a film set, were created for a film shoot, were then transferred into Technicolor stock, were then, you know, over many years uh, broadcast on television on a small screen, were made into still photographs as we're looking here, and ultimately translated into colors that are paint colors on your work. Um, lots of mediated experiences of color, but um, again, referring back to some sort of childhood memory and maybe a cultural memory that we all share in some ways. Yeah, I was terrified of that movie as a kid. I still find it really scary. Um, when I was working on this on, on this piece, I had the sound off because I didn't need the sound, I just needed the color. And um, so what, it's not so scary when you watch it with the sound off. And um, so it's actually kind of, related to the uh, light in the studio piece because it's um i mean it's part of it is in this tradition of being in the studio uh, you know artists for for uh centuries have made paintings of their studios i mean sometimes it's just what you do when there's nothing else to do you sort of look around and and and, and observe and i've spent a lot of time on and um well i can even show you this chair which i've had in the studio which was you know, looks really worse for wear, but I can't, I can't give it up. I've had that chair since uh, 19, uh, 1991. And, and one thing I really enjoy doing is watching the light change. And, um, and when I watch the light, you know, at the end of the day, um, the uh, light goes down and, and the colors disappear and turn to gray. So I, that, was something I wanted to make a work about. And so um, I thought, well, what is what is really about color and you know and and how does what what might be a good um, subject for for this kind of exploration? And I, I uh, eventually hit on uh, on the Wizard of Oz because I also wanted it to be a little bit cinematic. I mean it, it is this work would be is like the most boring movie by far you've ever watched because basically I mean, it's even more boring than watching paint dry because you're just watching paint the the colors go to gray and it's um it's uh i mean it's kind of it's it's a very it's obviously not for any everyone you need basically half an hour to sort of experience a piece to go from from uh from color to gray but it's um i I, I, I think it's, uh, I, I wanted to slow people down and the, and the work was originally made for SF MoMA when they were, um, when they were closed for renovation, they were doing projects offsite in Los Altos in, in Silicon Valley. And so it was a little bit of a, um, I, I was trying to just sort of uh, do a work that was anti-digital and that would really make people sort of slow down and look at something in a, in a very gradual way. And so, uh, so what happens is uh, all of these colors, I think there's 70 colors that I copied from The Wizard of Oz and sort of create and, and sort of put, not in any um, chronological order, but really in a sort of, uh, in an order that made an interesting visual composition. Um, I, um, th those are painted on the wall in a um, in a grid that is the same aspect ratio as the as the film The Wizard of Oz, so it is like a movie screen, and then you sit there and uh, the work um, sometimes comes with a sort of uh, a sort of card that you can keep track of when the colors disappear because different people. So it's really about subjectivity in a way also because people uh, will see uh, uh, certain colors disappear. Um, before other colors, and some people have better uh, vision in low light. Women generally have much better vision in low light and, and better long wavelength vision. So, so when they're looking at the reds and oranges, they have better, much better sensitivity to that. Um, and 
for example, the blues and the purples disappear first, and then the, uh, the oranges and the reds uh, are the last to disappear. And um, it is, uh, so it is, it is about time and it is, uh, I, I think the idea of making a, a, a work, um, a painting really that exists in time is something that I've always admired about other artists. And I think the classic example of this for me is Ad Reinhardt's paintings. And um, Lucy Lepard wrote an article about his work where she describes it, she describes the great genius of Reinhardt um, as making the work diachronic and that it exists in time, it changes. As you view it, um, things appear and, and disappear. And when I was a young artist, first in New York, I, um, I worked near MoMA and I would go over at lunchtime. And uh, Reinhardt was one thing, the paintings were one thing that I looked at and became really obsessed with and, and uh, really tried to understand and get a grasp of. So I guess it's kind of inevitable that that admiration came out in work like this. I think it's wonderful to hear you talk about that, about both slowing the viewer down, but also the relationship between time and painting. Um, I'm thinking about Houston, particularly with the Rothko Chapel and the way in which those paintings like Reinhardt yes. require yeah. a kind of passage of time to understand and, and let them reveal themselves because of their tonality. I'm interested too, as we're looking at these two images of the differentiation between seeing that work in an interior space at the Los Altos SF MoMA installation where the lighting could be controlled and these exterior um, installations where even on the right, the shadows are casting a different yeah, yeah. kind of uh, interruption in the in the vividness of the colors. Can you talk about that in terms of, you know, how you've experienced this work as it's lived in the world? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think it's great. I think when it's outdoors, it has a, you know, it has that sort of drive-in movie feeling to it, which I really, really love. And it's, um, and it is just, it is just color and it is just technicolor and it can be enjoyed on that level as well. And which gets back to something um, that you said earlier, where you talked about work that is conceptual and also beautiful and interesting to look at. And that's something that took me a while to get to because I started as a conceptualist and I really thought, I think I, Susan Sontag creates this uh, argument um, in one of her essays, I can't remember which one in On Silence. And she, she uh, I, th I think it's a false dichotomy, but she says, artists have the choice between uh, flattering the viewer or insulting the viewer. And I did not want to be the kind of artist that flattered the viewer. So I was, in the beginning, I was determined to insult the viewer. But as I, I you know, it's like the, the lesser of the two evils, but I, I think that is a false choice. And I think you can do a little bit of both. And I also really spent time thinking about the work that was most interesting to me. And that was work that was like, uh, say Reinhardt or, Warhol, which I was also looking at, at a lot at that time, uh, even Jasper Johns, uh, I, that it was work that was um, that was conceptual, but also visual and really interesting to look at. And you could look at it repeatedly. And so um, I think that if people can come back and, and see this work in different light conditions, you know, on different days, and they have a different experience, that would be, uh, for me, a fantastic thing. So that's a really interesting, um, uh, comment to connect you with art history. And I'm thinking particularly of Monet here. Um, and you've talked about Monet. I think you made work about Monet at RISD and the, particularly the pond. I think you called it a laboratory, which I love and I want to get into it in a minute. But I want to um, hear you speak about um, other artists who have made that, um, that evocation of time more explicit. I'm thinking about Monet in the series of whether it's Haystacks or Rouen Cathedral, making works in different lighting and atmospheric conditions to talk specifically about how optically we experience phenomena in different light conditions. And you know, here you're doing it in a singular work, but I think in the work that you made about another film, The Searchers, you were talking about the color of sunsets over yes. in different uh, situations atmospherically. Can you talk about that? Yeah, well, I, the uh, Monet was really um, Im important to me, and that um, when when I was as actually I can I'll just yeah. as I enter I'll walk through the studio to show you something, which is maybe a little too much of a revelation. But uh, when I was a student at RISD, I um, 
I was kind of a wise ass and was kind of against the institution. And remember, I was just really post Marxist at that point. So I, um, I did, I made a copy of a, um, of a, of a Monet painting. You see it, it's in the bathroom now on the shelf. And, uh, um, I guess it's not everyone. <laughs> Maybe that's bad Zoom behavior to be like giving a tour of the bathroom. But anyway, so, uh, the um, I, th my friends sort of dared me. They said, "Well, if it's so easy to, um, if it's so easy, and that work is so boring, why don't you do it?" And so I was challenged to make a copy of the Monet painting, and it was. Um, I mean, I've said this before, it's kind of a Stockholm syndrome situation where I, I, I fell in love with my victim or my hijacker or whatever it was. In that um, I spent a week uh, working on the painting and then a week copying the frame, molding it in clay and, and made this copy, which, you know, isn't bad. Um, and I learned so much from that experience. And it was, you know, I, I'm not interested in that kind of easel painting, but it made me really admire Monet and what he did, and it also made me uh, understand how paint works, how layering layering works, and like certain things that I learned just from doing that, which is now thirty years ago, I I still I still am using today. So it was it was it was really a, a sort of um, great experience for me, even though I was being sarcastic when when I did it, and. Then as, as time went by, I became more interested in Monet's um, serial work because I felt it was anti-photographic. And I was against the idea of a single image telling some sort of truth. Um, I felt that there was something sort of totalitarian about it, that, that uh, photography had a claim to truth. I mean, now it's less so because everything is so, so uh, vague and easily changed and, and you know, so, there, the claim to truth is, is harder to make. But I, I was interested more in this idea of multiple views of things and trying to understand, trying to get at something by approaching it from different angles and in different light conditions. And you say, well, which of those views of the haystack is the accurate one? I mean, they're all accurate. And by looking at all of them, you have a better understanding of what it is. And they're also all wrong. And, and for me, that's really beautiful and kind of an essential truth of, about art. And that the, the searcher's piece um, was kind of a crazy piece where I um, made the work in Monument Valley where the searchers was filmed and then used uh, stills from the film, the searchers projected onto the wall to recreate the changing light in my motel room as the sun went down. So that was um, one of my uh, crazier works that took a really long time to make, and but it did kind of work out in the end. Terrific. Let's um, let's talk about science a little bit. You you mentioned your brother, the scientist. Um, I perceive in your work, obviously, and I think most people do, this kind of passionate interest in observation and somewhat uh, your own version of the scientific method of of kind of testing theory, uh, particularly color theory in in some cases, phenomenology, other ways of of looking at the world. And I think your work sort of hovers between this kind of scientific approach and this poetic, intuitive, um, more subjective approach. So I wonder if you can talk about that, both your relationship to science, maybe to your brother even, um, and the way in which science kind of plays a role or scientific method plays a role in work. I'm cognizant also of the piece that um, I heard you speak about on video, um, an installation at RISD where you called Monet's pond an invention, a laboratory invention that he used as a a generative thing for painting rather than, you know, a beautiful pond to experience in nature. So I'm interested in that notion of the laboratory and the construction of a laboratory that you've um, also adopted in your own work. Yeah, um, I mean, uh, my, um, my father was a scientist also, he was a chemist, so that probably explains a lot. Um, and, um, and, and so I, um, I took a lot of science classes as a kid. I mean, because I think the, my, there was pressure to do that. And, you know, I, 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 uh, my parents were supportive enough that when I wanted to do something else, they let me do that. And I'm, I'm eternally grateful to them for that. But, um, but I have that sort of background and, you know, I, I, maybe it's just also part of my nature to uh, like that um, 
the way of that way of understanding the world. And I think that that um, it's I think it's also probably connected to my early art training and the certain the kind of rules of of conceptualism and uh, like the conceptualists who were my teachers. You know, they followed these rules. There was a certain grammar to making art, and you would and 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 uh, it wasn't so loosey goosey. And uh, for better or worse, I, I adapt adopted that um, that's kind of system, and um, then adapted it to be my 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 own. And I think um, it's it is it's not really about objectivity so much as it's much more about subjectivity and which is where it it connects to Monet. So you have Monet being, you know, very um, subjective in the service of being objective and finding, you know, finding through these multiple views, finding something. And I think what I always liked in science class was that when you would do an experiment, the, the points on the graph would never be right on the line where they were supposed to be. I mean, the dots would always be off the line a little bit. And that sort of error, which is what comes from observation and from uh, you know mistakes, I think is where the sort of beauty lies and where the where the art is. And it's um, one reason I love um, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, which I um, which I kind of misunderstand. I, I think kind of intentionally for my own purposes, but. Um, and I was corrected once when I talked about it in a lecture, and there was an astrophysicist in the in the audience. But fortunately, in the Zoom call, no one can talk back at me. So I'll just say what I like about the about Heisenberg's uncertainty principle is that even though it's really just is is works on a subatomic level, I like to think about it working on a sort of physical level. That when you look at something, you change something. That when you um, that when you look at something, you take something away from that. And it's connected to all kinds of other things um, in, in, like, in, in culture, especially in terms of representation. And one of my favorite quotes, um, sort of anti-photographic quotes, is um, a, a quote attributed to Crazy Horse, who was offered a lot of money to be photographed and was really resistant to, uh, to, um, to being photographed. And he said, why would you wish to... Uh, to shorten my life by taking from me my shadow. And this idea of, of being of observed and how that, and, and being recorded and how that changes, that changes your, your, your soul kind of. And um, so now I'm really kind of going off the rail, but they are, it is sort of connected to this idea of, of observation being subjective and, and, and wrong, but at the same time, trying to be, you know, not wanting to give up, trying to really trying to understand something through the sort of multi, multiple observations, multiple subjective observations, which is in fact, um, you know, the scientific method. I think that's great. I mean, as you were speaking, particularly if you're read of the uncertainty principle, I was thinking about Robert Irwin and the quote or the title of his autobiography, seeing is the name, seeing is forgetting the name of the thing one sees. Yes. Yeah. And you can't name something and see it at the same time. Yeah. They, they're yeah. diametrically different. Uh, there's a question in the chat, and I'm just going to throw this in here while we're looking at back to Kansas. The, the question of the prevalence of the grid, and I would maybe broaden the question to the prevalence of this kind of empirical structure in your work, because it's not sort of altogether subjective. You are relying on a grid or a structure, and you just spoke about the imprecision or the in, imperfectness of certain kinds of scientific or mathematical grids, and yet you use them. Yeah, yes. I mean, it's a good question. And I think, you know, in some ways, it's probably a crutch. But it's also a way of it not being about expression. I'm not so interested, obviously, in, in self-expression. Of course, it comes through in, in ways that are somehow uh, sometimes even, you know, embarrassing in retrospect. But it, um, it is a way of sort of organizing space in a way that is a kind of default and that people sort of accept it as a way of presenting multiple uh, images in a, with sort of equal equal weight. And um, so it is, I mean, sometimes I break the grid up and have it a little bit looser, but it is, it is something that I, um, I do use. Um, and I think it also comes out of the, of the um, tradition of conceptual art and, uh, and it's photography in particular. So while you were speaking, Spencer, the image from the 9-11 Museum, if we can go back to it was, 
uh, powerfully present. And you spoke about not wanting to be so expressive in the work. And yet in this work, which I think perhaps is your most visible public work, I mean, it's certainly one seen by many, many millions of people that, uh, that go to that institution. My father-in-law is a docent there and I hear about it regularly, <laughs> about people's response to it. Um, yeah. I wonder if you can talk about this because obviously there is a similarity in the approach in this work to many other works in your, in your history. And yet there is kind of an overtly emotion laden um, uh, context or underpinning here. Yeah, so I mean, it's an incredibly, you know, complicated work for me to even talk about and, and it, it, it took a long time and went through various iterations and um, I mean, there, it was originally going to be a light projection of uh, of different. I mean, I wanted it. I, I wanted the work to be, it was you know, it's sort of a memorial, and I wanted it to be about remembering. I wanted it to be about the act of remembering. So I didn't want it to just be something that is a picture of something that's remembered. I wanted it to be about uh, the act for the viewer of remembering, and. Um, and as I was working on it, um, I mean, it started out as this sort of light projection with different shades of blue projected onto that enormous wall. And, and as I was working, I realized um, as a, um, really as a, as a citizen, I, I had a, a duty and as a, as a resident of New York and as a, as a person who loves New York City, um, that I had a, kind of a duty to do something that was more devotional. And so, um, I mean, I'm not a religious person, but I, I do kind of believe in that activity of devotion in, in, in work. And so I decided to make them make this work as 3000 individual watercolors uh, that would um, each be an attempt on my part to try to remember the color of the sky on that, on that Day. I mean, I, I on, on the roof of this building, I watched the towers collapse, it, and I remember the sky. And then, right here on Union Street, there were people walking back from Manhattan. I mean, it was a very intense and and powerful uh, uh, experience for me, as it was for for many people in New York and and beyond. Um, but I, I I felt this. Um, I I really wanted to. I, I felt like I had to make it myself. I had to, it had to be handmade. There had to be this act of, of um, yeah, for lack of a better word, devotion. And it took a long time to do. And, um, and there is a fragility to it because it's, it's on paper. I mean, the, the um, pigment is quite durable. It's, it's holding up really well, but I, I, wanted, I, I wanted it to be physical and also fragile and also clearly handmade. That, those were all important to me. It's interesting that your description of the process of making as being devotional. It's a, it's another aspect of that kind of duration that's embedded in the works that we looked at earlier, which is really more on the part of the viewer, kind of echoing the duration of a film or the duration of the change of light. Uh, and this is a different kind of duration, your own time uh, investment in making these 3000 uh, plus works. Um, and also, as you said, the act of remembering for the viewer is also an act that you're illustrating, an act of remembering on your own part, um, literally painting what you remember of the sky over and over and over again. And, yeah. and you know, maybe Sisyphean like never getting it right, right? Yeah. It, exactly. it, the one is yeah. not there. Yeah, it's in there, it's in there somewhere. It's in and there. you know, I, mean, I was very uncertain about the work. I mean, a lot of people were uncertain about the work. That work, uh, it, I, it was required in the contract, I think, that it had to be designed so that it could be taken down within 48 hours, you know, because it's such a sensitive site and there was concern that, you, well, maybe things could go wrong. Maybe there's something that we're not thinking about. So it had to be, it, it, was, it, was, a, um, it was designed so that it could be very quickly removed if it had to be. And um, so I think it's, it, it, is a, it, is, it is complicated and it is, um, you know, to, you know, Different people had very different ideas about what should be, what should be at the um, at the site of, of, of the 9/11 disaster. Absolutely, I remember well the many discussions at political levels, at artistic levels, about what was an appropriate uh, response for that space. I wonder if we could turn to uh, some recent work. I know in the deck we have some 
quite recent works from the last year or two, um, often using light making or light emitting uh, devices. And I'd love to hear you speak about those. Can we look at uh, some next images? There we go. Uh, and, and even beyond, I don't remember the date of this work, even here. And talk to us about what's occupying you uh, nowadays, what kind of investigations you're involved in and what these works. Uh, yeah. Um, so the works on the uh, on the left in where it says uh, in the installation at, at Rona Hoffman Gallery, those are drawings of um, following a bee. And when you mentioned um, Monet's laboratory um, or garden as being a laboratory, it's something that really interested me and in that I um, have become a bit of a gardener. And so I decided to try to do it a little bit myself, like take a page from Monet's, Monet's book. And so I plant a ton of zinnias. And then when they bloom in late, start starting in late July, I um, sit on a ladder, a tall ladder, high above the zinnias, and uh, wait for a bee to come in to pollinate them, and then follow the bee, and then trace. So, so what I do is I take a photograph when I'm up on the ladder, and um, and uh, then print out the photograph, put a piece of acetate on top of it, and then trace the um, the uh, line of flight of the bee through the zinnias, and then mark each flower where it stops, and um, and then use that. I mean, I do a lot of them, and some are good, and some are not so good. And then I lose them, I and mean, sometimes they move too quickly, or they they uh, fly uh, underneath. Um, other flowers and I can't see where they come up. And once in a while they actually fall asleep on the flower. I mean, it's had, I, I now have a limit. It's like five minutes if they don't move, they're not gonna be moving for a long time. So then I, I quit and I start again. But I mean, I never knew that like these, sometimes they're just like, they're just like pooped out, I think. And they just need to take a break. And so they'll just stay there for an hour or so sometimes on, on one zinnia. So if I see them stopping, then I, you know, I start again with another one. So, so that's, that's, an example of kind of letting um, letting the bee make the drawing and uh, you know sort of give, giving it up. So so there is a very expressive line in the drawing, and uh, that line is made by the bee. The color is um, is pastel, soft uh, pastel, which uh, references the pollen of the flower. And I use I precisely match the color of each flower with with pastel. The work on the right here is. Um, I mean, this is the kind of uh, work that, I mean, if 30 years ago I knew I was going to be making something like this, I would be appalled. And uh, it's, um, but it is, it is about observations and it's about um, minor observations. It's just things that I see during the day um, and it's called, uh, it's called Color Notes. And I, I was given the gift of a book by, uh, Woman named Emily Noyes Vanderpoel, which she did, or which she made around 1900. It's a fantastic book. It came back in print maybe three years ago, um, and she did sort of abstract observations, very Albert-esque ob observations of nature and sort of grids of color. She was a watercolorist and also an educator, and she did this, you know, 50 years before Albert was doing it, and of course got no credit for it. Um, but I, re I really became interested in her, in her observations of, uh, of these sort of color notes of looking at things um, in the natural world and then uh, focusing on the color and then creating little, um, little uh, groupings of color that are sort of uh, abstract and sort of lean in some cases into representation. And I mean, there's, there's, uh, things about a lot of artists I like in these works. Like I, I, I mean, Richard Tuttle is an artist I admired, I've admired for years. And I think that there's, um, you know, a lot that I, I've stolen from him that's in them. I mean, obviously from Emily Noyes Vanderpoel. Um, I, I like the idea of making works that are sort of minor and then putting a bunch of them together so that you have this sort of grouping that gives it a little more, um, significance and uh you know i think it, it, i mean there's the expectation of what art can do is um i i think for me it's it's gotten um 
smaller over time. I mean, I, I started off with making very, uh, very political art and very um, sort of activist art. And uh, for various reasons, I ended up, you know, making, make, <laughs> making color notes. And uh, um, so I, I guess it's part, it's part of the progression and um, it's something that is, uh, it looks like it's a lot of fun to make. And it's, of course, I'm always happy to be in the studio making stuff, but um, it is kind of excruciating because it's hard to, it's hard to get the colors right. It's hard to figure out how to, you know, it's so small and so there's so little going on that each decision kind of becomes uh, big and can be paralyzing. It's, uh, it's so interesting to hear you talk about these because on one hand, you contrasted the work of Emily Vanderpool with Albers and his color studies, which of course would have been in a very rigid geometry and the grid you've eschewed here in favor of these somewhat biomorphic, somewhat um, uh, gestural color yeah. studies. But then of course you've created a grid out of <laughs> right. all the so it's, I it's can't help myself, yeah. It's a little bit of, it's a bit, little bit of yin and yang, I guess. And, Indeed. and I, I think there is, I mean, there's something, you know, more feminine about these sort of, this sort of softer uh, amorphous watercolors, which I, which I really kind of appreciate. And it's, it's less, um, I don't know, it's gentler. And I, I think it's, um, it's, uh, uh, it is a, um, and yet it connects to the world. And, you know, it's, so it's about, it's really about looking at the world and finding beauty in the world. And I think for me, that's still the greatest thing about being an artist is that I, I feel um, that I, I look at things more carefully and I see things and that make they, that give me joy and, and to, to be able to look at the world and to, to see things like that, I, I feel in, in, incredibly lucky. And, and this work is in some ways about that. I mean, it doesn't have to be, um, it doesn't have to be, uh, you know, something spectacular. It doesn't have to be Niagara Falls. It can be like something, um, something very minor, which is, I, I'm working on some other things, which I don't have, they're mostly away now, but I'll just show that these are, um, this is a series of drawings that I've been working on that are uh, mistakes, um, where I, I look at something like this one, and these are just sort of test boards. So this is a kitchen scrubber mistaken for a kale leaf. So I keep track of things that I look at and I have to look at again, because I see it wrong. And so I'm working on, on drawings that sort of are, are made to be looked at out of the corner of your eye so that you see you, you see a kale leaf on the counter but you also see a kitchen scrubber and it can that can be both things and that sort of ambiguity and those sort of tricks of of perception i find really so kind of fun and and very human nice so um spencer you may have answered this question that came up in the chat and i'm interested it's an artist asking you commented earlier when speaking about these color studies um, that your younger self 30 years ago might have been appalled to be making work like this. And, and her question is, why would your younger self have been appalled at that? And you may have answered it when you spoke about the relative insignificance or smallness or even the femininity of this work, but I would love it if you would answer that. Yeah, I think I, um, I, th I think I felt art had to be uh, more deeply philosophical, maybe, that um, that I was wrestling with bigger things. I mean, I thought I was, and I, I wasn't really. Um, and I think I was also suspicious of people who made beautiful things. It seemed like there was, um, that art had more important things to deal with than that. And um, I mean, this is uh, it's really a subject for another uh, conversation, but I, I, I slowly, realized as I also wanted to make things more beautiful, I also realized that the things that I was doing um, in terms of uh, politics in, in my art or, or social activism in my art, I felt I, I could do that more successfully um, as, a, um, as a citizen. And that actually came from a job. I, I, had, a, I had a day job for a long time as a, a social studies uh, editor and um, for, for uh, school books for kids. And so um, I, uh, I realized that in, in that job, I was able to have more of an impact on what, uh, what kids were, weren't learning in a fourth grade social studies class than 
honestly, I could, as as uh, as an artist in a museum, um, making making something. Or I mean, at that point, there was no work in a museum. I was just working alone in my my studio. So, so I it it, it kind of freed me up in a way in that I um, I, I felt uh, I, I felt that um, I was able to I could do my I could do thing. I had responsibilities as, as a citizen, and that I could do work that was that di didn't have to be. I guess that, that I didn't have to be quite such a good boy, you know, and and do uh, do what I thought was like you know the moral thing. And that also then allowed me to do um, to to do uh, work that was uh, more interesting uh, visually and and compelling visually. And I should also add. That it's something that is also changing. That changes as I get older, and I become, I've become more interested in other artists who do work that is more politically engaged and find it, um, and and find it uh, interesting and um, and successful. So I mean, it's really you know, it's my own journey, and I think that there, I'm, I'm not saying that there is not successful political art. I'm saying that it was not. Uh, it it. It didn't make sense for me. I understood. I, I only wish that in that job as a social studies children's book editor, you had worked in Texas where I think they need you badly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I did actually work on a Texas state book. I worked on the Arkansas uh, 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 state history book. And I also, you know, I also learned so much about the um, about the country and, and, and our history. And now, I, now there's a lot of, I mean, there always was push in Texas on social studies. So it's nothing new, but now I think it's becoming even more extreme. Yeah, but, uh, but I mean, the the history of states, you know, it's 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 like small, it's like it's like minor in some ways, but they're like incredible people and also wonderful people. And and for example, you know, I worked on a on a um, the the social studies uh, book I worked on in uh, for Arkansas was in 1990. I mean, that was a long time ago. And the social studies book that they had in schools at that point, there were there was not a single photograph of an African American person in that book, and so um, you know we felt like there was you know we were presenting the you know the broad range of of Arkansans and you know I mean there's all kinds of people and this book was the first one to do it and I was incredibly proud of it and when I went down to Arkansas to uh, to train teachers to use the book. I mean, especially in the Delta area, uh, which is which is uh, predominantly African American. I mean, teachers were really moved by the book. I mean, there are teachers who said, you know, my kids want to see uh, images in their book and stories in the book of people who are like them. And you know, of course, that's like normal. We all know that now. And and for the, for me, that was incredibly moving to have that experience with teachers. And I thought, you know, I can't. I, I don't know if that. Can, if I can, do, if I would succeed in doing that as an artist, and the only work that actually has had that kind of impact, which was not intentional, was the 9/11 piece, and probably nothing else I do again will ever have that kind of. Impact. Well, I, I want to thank you for your work in Arkansas, having lived there myself, and uh, shout out to Crystal Bridges, which is the organizing museum of, of color fields yeah. of the exhibition, and and having lived there in the 21st century, uh, it's the state has come a long way, and obviously, as with many. Uh, regions of the country, there is a backlash and there is constantly a, a battle between progressive and anti-progressive forces, but um, I appreciate the work that you did back then. I want to uh, shift gears and kind of move toward um, the future and ask you to speak directly to students who may be watching. This is a university after all, and there are many students engaged in uh, studies of art, uh, studio art practice, post-studio practice, art history as I was, and, um, and give them uh, a sense of maybe your own journey in that post-academic uh, mo mo moment. So uh, you mentioned RISD and, and leaving RISD um, and kind of going out into the world as a burgeoning artist. What advice or career thoughts could you give to uh, young students who may be making that same trajectory? Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it is, it's hard. Uh, I mean, there's no doubt about it. And I think, um, I mean, I didn't make a living from my work until I was 42, I think, or 43. So it was a long haul. I was, and I was doing publishing work. I mean, I, I had various jobs um, 
when I moved to New York. And it was just, you know, it was normal. You would get a job and then you would work in the studio at night and on weekends. And I actually got a lot done. Um, and I, I really wanted a job that was different from, that was not connected to the art world. So I had friends who worked at galleries or who worked as museum guards or who did something or as, as art movers. And I really did not want to see what the art world was like because I knew it would depress me. And so I wanted a job in, in something else. So I managed to land this job in publishing because I had an undergraduate degree in literature. And, um, and it was great. I met lots of different people who were, who were, uh, who were not artists, but, but often very creative. And I'm still friends with many of those people from that time. At the same time, I had a community of people who I went to school with, um, artists, and we spent a lot of time together. And it was really important in the early years to have that community of people and to have that feedback. I mean, I see them uh, much less now, and I, I still have a lot of friends who are artists, but there's not that sense of community. But it was, it was sort of crucial then, especially when you, um, I think it's normal to have um, this thought, well, what's the point? I should just sort of give up. What, what is the point of it? And you know that that would happen every couple months uh, back then, and now it happens every couple of years. But I think it's normal, and I think that those doubts, I think to have those kind of doubts is uh, is a positive thing. It's not a negative thing. I mean, there are some people, some artists who just sort of make their own oxygen, who have their own, you know, trajectory, and nothing's going to stop them, and they 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 are they are able to do it without the help of, of other of, of friends in a, a community. I, I was not like that. And I think it's um, to, to, um, to have people to act as sounding boards and also to, um, to have doubts about it and, and also to question um, what, what it is that you're doing. I think it's really important. And I think the other important thing is to look at a lot of art. I did not have a, a very strong history, uh, background in art history but I started looking at a lot of paintings and I spent a lot of time at the Met and, um, and just looked at all kinds of different art from all different cultures and, uh, his and different periods in history. And that was really, it was really helpful for me to be, to, to look at a lot of art. I think that that's very sound advice. I wanna just echo that to burgeoning art historians as I once was and, and entering a profession I left an undergraduate degree in art history without having an idea in my head about what I would do as a career. I knew I wanted to learn more. And in fact, the more I learned in graduate programs and a master's and a doctoral program, the more I knew I wanted to learn. In other words, the more I knew, the less I knew, or the, the more I knew how little I know. And, um, and the, the experiences that I had both in museums looking at paintings as you did, but also talking to artists and, and that for me, continues to be one of the most driving influences in my own work, my own thinking, my own writing. Um, I've spent a lot of time on studio visits. I will say this was a delightful one to have you virtually touring us about the studio, which is remarkable and I appreciate greatly. But the opportunity, the luxury of having living artists to talk to, unlike all of those artists in the past that we only get to discern or read or try to uh, extrapolate what they may have been thinking is something we shouldn't uh, ignore. We should always be in conversation. I think all of us who are both viewers of art and thinkers about art should always be in conversation with the makers of art. And so this to me has been a very rich conversation, one that I appreciate and learned a great deal from. Uh, the specialness of being with you in the studio virtually and walking around the studio with you can't be uh, overestimated. And I hope for the students that are watching, this is a real inspiration for them, whether they be studio practitioners or art historians or anything else. Um, so I want to thank you, Spencer, for your time today. For your and, and I'd like to also say, Don, that I, I still have a, a, a pretty strong imposter complex. And I'm still like, I'm still amazed when anyone is interested in the work. I mean, that might sound uh, ridiculous, but it is, you know, when someone, uh, you know, shares the spirit in which the work is made. And uh, I mean, I, I think that is, for me, it's as exciting now as it was, you know, when I when I was 25. And I think that that is, um, I mean, every artist wants to make some sort of connection like that. I think uh, we're not just making it for ourselves. And when when there is someone who, you know, when you think, oh, someone is actually spending time 
I mean, there's not many, but there's some people who've watched who've watched through the entire Back to Kansas thing. And I think someone is doing that. It's like incredible. I mean, and so, you know, it's so gratifying as an artist that there is, you know, that someone thinks something that you do is um, is is worthwhile. And that never stops being a huge uh, motivator. And I think part of the problem with this last year and the pandemic was not being able to have the interaction with people and not get not being able to get feedback and and um, and, and and to have that that motivation. Well, I appreciate both your humility, but also that very direct statement about the meaning of of art as communication, as connection. Um, and I feel it from the other side very greatly. So I'm delighted to have met you and I hope we continue our conversation. I certainly will continue to look at your work. I hope everyone watching and those beyond will take the occasion to both see the work in color field, the, the Back to Kansas piece, which is on view, as Maria said, for at least another three weeks till the, uh, I think the 20th of June, she said. And also I understand a, a work at the collection of the Museum of Fine Arts Houston has recently gone on view in their restaurant. So uh, at least two occasions to see your work in, in Houston for those watching from, from that great place. Thanks so much, Don. I really enjoyed it. It was really, it was, it was a real pleasure for me. Thank you, Spencer, I did too. Thanks Maria and all for, uh, for arranging and for all of you watching, uh, there's a, a poll popping up on site and I hope you enjoyed today. Thanks so much for being here. Okay. Yes, thanks Maria, bye.